Willie George. And read by Julie Moore. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made the dry land and the sea. He made the trees and flowers. He created every kind of animal. He made birds and fish and every kind of creeping thing. And all that God made was good. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. Then God made someone special. This creature was not like the others before him. God made this creature in his own image and his own likeness. God called his new friend Adam, which means man. Genesis 1.27 God made Adam to have dominion over all the earth. He made Adam to be the boss of all creation. He was to have dominion over all the animals and plants and even the earth itself. God was very good to Adam. God created many trees and made a garden in Eden for Adam. He told Adam to eat the fruit of the trees. And then God planted two trees and put them in the middle of the garden. One tree was called the tree of life. And eating its fruit would cause one to live forever. The other tree in the midst of the garden was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God told Adam, never eat that fruit from it. He said, if you eat its fruit, you will surely die. Genesis 1, 28 through 30. Genesis 2, 8 and 9, 16 through 17. A little later, God caused a deep sleep to come on Adam, and he took a rib from his side. And with that rib, God made Adam a companion and a helper. He named her Eve. Adam told Eve, all the things that God had told him about the trees in the middle of the garden. Adam did not eat the fruit from the tree of life. He did not tell Eve about its special fruit. One day, as Eve was near the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she heard a voice, the voice of a serpent. He called her near to the tree and tempted her with its fruit. God doesn't want you to eat this fruit, said the snake, because he knows that you'll become as wise as he. You continued to tempt Eve until she took a bite from that fruit. Oh, nothing happened. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Adam, who'd been standing nearby, took the fruit into his hands. His conscience told him not to eat that fruit. But suddenly he did, and a most terrible thing happened. He lifted that fruit to his mouth and took a bite. Instantly, Adam's spirit began to shake inside him. His spirit began to die. It became filled with evil and fear, and Adam knew that he had done a terrible wrong thing. He took Eve and he ran to hide. As Adam ran through the garden, fear gripped his heart. What will God say about what I've done? Genesis 3, 6, Romans 5, 12 and 14. In the cool of the day, as God always had, he came to the Garden of Eden to talk with Adam and Eve. As he called their names, Adam and Eve hid themselves in the trees. Finally, Adam came forward and told the Lord what he had done. Sadly, God told Adam that curses would come upon him and Eve and the earth because of his sin. Suddenly, God turned to the serpent and spoke sternly to him. You will become the lowest of the animals. You'll eat their dust and crawl on your belly all the days of your life. There will be much trouble between you and this woman, and her seed will bruise your head, though you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3, 8 through 19. Then Adam and Eve were driven from the Garden of Eden, and Adam had to work hard to get the crops to grow, and the weeds sprang forth and choked out the good plants. Even the animals were different. Once they played and romped together. Now the strong ones hunted and killed the others. Sin had made the earth ugly. Genesis 3, 23 and 24. Romans 8, 22 and 20. Little did Adam realize that his sin would bring. He was choosing to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life. Adam became a slave to sin. And since sin was created by the fallen angel Lucifer, Adam became his slave. This sad truth is Adam's disobedience gave Lucifer the power to control the world and all its people. Lucifer, who is the source of all evil, filled the hearts of Adam's children with sin. He spoke wicked thoughts into their hearts and minds, and he caused wars and floods and famines and disaster. He turned God's beautiful earth 
into a terrible mess. Luke 4, 6, Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. But God never forgot his creation. Time after time he sent his prophets to tell the people about a savior, a messiah, who would come and make the earth and its people right once more. The prophet Isaiah said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7, and Isaiah 7, 14. Thousands of years passed, and God's people kept looking for the promise of the Savior. Then an angel appeared to a virgin in Nazareth called Mary. He told her she would have a special baby. This baby, he said, will be called the Son of God. And soon it happened, just as the angel had said, Mary and her new husband Joseph journeyed to Bethlehem, and there the child, Jesus, was born. Luke 1, 26-33, Matthew 2, 1. The child Jesus grew and became tall and strong and had favor with men and God. He listened daily to the stories his mother told him of the angel's visit to her and about his miraculous birth. He went as often as he could to the synagogues and read the Holy Scriptures. As he read, he found the words that the prophets had spoken about him. He knew that God had a special ministry for him to do. When Jesus reached his 30th birthday, he traveled to the Jordan River and was baptized by John the Baptist, like all the other believers of God. But as he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove and gave him power to do miracles. And a voice came from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus went throughout Israel after that, preaching and teaching the people of God about God. He told them wonderful things and made it easy for them to understand the things of God. Luke 4, 32 and Matthew 9, 35. Jesus took authority over sickness and disease, for he knew that it had come from God's enemy, Satan. Satan and Lucifer are the same person, just a different name. Jesus forgave the sins of the people and healed their sick bodies. Many of the people believed that Jesus was God's son. Some did not. Those who believed were blessed and healed, while those who doubted got nothing. Once, while Jesus taught the people in the wilderness, there was not enough food to eat the whole big crowd to feed on. So Jesus took a little boy's lunch and blessed it and multiplied the food. As he tore the loaves and fishes in half, the torn pieces grew back together. There were 12 baskets left after the crowd of 5,000 people had fed. That's a lot of food. Matthew 14, 17 through 21, and John 6, 9 through 13. Jesus was kind to people. In fact, he never once did a wrong thing in his entire life. He showed the people what God is like. Jesus loved children, too. Once he took a group of them into his arms and blessed them one by one, he told the disciples that heaven would be filled with children. Hebrews 4, 15, and Matthew 19, 13 through 15. Jesus met many people whose lives were filled with sin, and he always showed forgiveness to those who asked. Once he met a wicked, wrong-doing woman who had been married five times. She'd done many evil things, but Jesus spoke kindly to her. He told her about eternal life and God's love for her and the water of God. And the woman was so touched that she became a new person, and she told everybody in town about Jesus. John 4 7 through 26, and John 8, 4 through 11. After preaching for three years, Jesus knew that his earthly ministry would soon be over. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey's back, and many of the people worshipped him. They wanted Jesus to become their king and destroy the Romans who controlled their country. The people did not understand what Jesus had to do. Hosanna to God in the highest! Hosanna to the king, they shouted. Matthew 21, 1 through 11, John 12, 16. One night, Jesus gathered his disciples together to celebrate the Passover. As they ate the Passover supper, Jesus told them that he would make a new covenant between God and man. The disciples did not fully understand what Jesus meant about this. What is Jesus going to do, they asked each other. Matthew 26, 18 through 30, Luke 21, 20. Now you would think that everyone loved Jesus because he had done no wrong, and he was so nice to everyone. But that was not so. 
Satan filled the hearts of many people and caused them to hate Jesus. Jesus' teachings made them feel guilty about their sins. So one of Jesus' very own disciples, Judas Iscariot by name, went to the rulers and said, If you'll give me money, I'll show you where to find Jesus. And so they agreed. John 13, 27, Luke 22, 3 through 5. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and went into a garden to pray. In the garden, Jesus knew that the time of his death was near. He prayed to Father God to be certain that the time had come, and surely enough it had. He said, could there possibly be any other way to do Father God's will? He sweat drops of blood as he prayed, and his disciples were so stressed out, they slept instead of praying one hour. Jesus said, could you not tarry with me one hour? But they were too exhausted. As he rose up from praying, an angry mob of soldiers had come to find him. Judas was in the front of the group. As Jesus went forward to meet them, he called out, Who are you looking for? Matthew 26, 47. The angry men replied, We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I am he. And suddenly the men fell backwards and were knocked to the ground by the power of God and his words. Once again, Jesus asked them, Who are you looking for? We want Jesus of Nazareth, they cried. And Jesus again answered boldly, I am he. And the same thing happened again. The mob was knocked to the ground by God's power. Jesus could have escaped, but he chose to stay. I am is God's name. He told Moses on Mount Sinai that his name was I am. John 18, 5 through 11. Mark 14, 43 through 46. Then Judas came near to Jesus and kissed him on the cheek. At that signal, the men rushed toward Jesus to bind him with ropes. Matthew 26, 49, Mark 14, 45, and 46. Suddenly, Jesus' disciples came forward, and Peter drew out his sword and cut off the left ear of Malchus, a servant of the high priest. Mark 14, 47. Peter, put away your sword, said Jesus, and he reached down to the ground and picked up Malchus' ear. He put it on his head, and the ear was completely healed. Still the angry mob would not be stopped. They bound Jesus and took him to the Roman governor of Judea, Judea Pontius Pilate. Mark 14, 47-53, and Luke 22, 50-54. As Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, many false accusers came before the governor and told lies about him. I heard this man say he's going to destroy our temple, said one. This man has done nothing wrong, said Pontius Pilate. Why don't you take him and judge him yourself? Then the mob of angry Jews screamed in unison, Crucify him! Mark 14, 55-58 and Matthew 27, 11-24. They were very angry. So then Pilate had an idea. If I had this Jesus fellow beaten with whips, he said to himself, perhaps these Jews will settle down and let him live. Then the governor turned to his guards and ordered them to beat Jesus. The soldiers used whips with many straps to beat the back of Jesus. Each strap of leather held pieces of glass and bone or sharp stones. In a few minutes, Jesus' back was covered with bloody stripes. In this way, he paid for our sicknesses and diseases. The scriptures say, by his stripes, we are healed in Isaiah 55, 5. Luke 23, verse 22. When Jesus, when, Ju when the Jews saw Jesus and what Pilate had done to him, their hearts were not changed. Still they cried, crucify him, crucify him. And so, for the fear of the Jews, Pilate ordered that Jesus should be taken to Calvary and crucified. But he said, You crucify him. I see no guilt in him. I wash my hands of this matter. Luke 23, 22-25 and Mark 15, 15-20. At the top of the hill called Calvary, the Roman soldiers nailed Jesus to a cross. They stood by to watch as the Son of God gave up his life. And they gambled for his robes. Jesus knew that this was God's plan. Although he suffered agony on the cross, his love for the people kept him from calling for angels to release him. Jesus was being punished for the sins of the whole human race. Every part of him suffered. 
In his soul and body, Jesus became filled with sin. He became sin for us that we might have righteousness. This spiritually separated Jesus from Father God. And he said, it is finished. And then he cried, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Forgive them. And into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up his life. Matthew 26, 15 through 54, and 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. After a few hours on the cross, Jesus died. His body was carried to a tomb and prepared for burial. They borrowed someone else's tomb. His spirit and soul went down into the heart of the earth. And as Jesus entered into hell, legions of demons met with their master Lucifer to celebrate their victory over Jesus. At last! Satan thought that he had finally defeated God. All the sins of all the people ever born were placed on Jesus. Satan had caught the Son of God. For three days and nights, Jesus suffered in the heart of the earth. The hordes of Satan creatures danced around him and mocked his name. But Jesus preached to those in hell and took captivity captive. He set the captives free out of their cells. He told of his victory over sin and how he, the Messiah, had paid for all their sins. And if they believed in him, they would have eternal life and go to the Father God with him. He took the keys of death and hell and the grave so that we that believe would have no fear. Suddenly the ground began to shake. A blast of wind swept through the dungeons of hell and rushed towards the Son of God. His spirit began to glow within him and without of him, and God's power was full of him, and the sin that had once covered him vanished. His mission had been completed, and God the Father and the Holy Spirit informed him it was time for resurrection. Matthew 12, 39 through 40, Romans 8, 11. A look of anger came over his face, and he burst those chains that had held him. Satan looked helpless at the Son of God, who had now come near. Demons ran, screaming in all directions, and the Lord of Lords took Satan into his hands. Colossians 2.15, 1 Corinthians 2.8. The fight lasted only seconds, because Satan in all his might was no match for the king of kings. Jesus took the keys of death and hell and the grave and hung that used to hang at Satan's waist. And with these keys forever taken from him, Satan's power would be useless against those who loved God. Then in an instant he disappeared, leaving the devil trembling in a heap. Revelation 1, 17 and 18. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Jesus quickly found the tomb where his body had been lying, and he entered into his body once again. He raised himself up from the dead, and the stone lifted. And when he lifted his hands to thank God, and Jesus, as he rose from the dead, the angels pushed the stone away from the door of the tomb. As they peeped out of the tomb, the Roman guards fainted. So they gained strength and ran to the Jewish leaders, and they soon told everything they'd seen. Then Jesus' disciples came to the tomb, and they were confused. We've come to treat his body for death. Where is his body? What has happened to the Lord? The disciples had forgotten everything Jesus had told them about his resurrection because they were so afraid, and the Romans were trying to find them to kill them. And they simply did not believe that he could have raised from the dead. They saw him dead. Matthew 28, 2 through 4. John 20, 3 through 9. A while later, the disciples were startled as Jesus appeared to them alive and well in the upper room where they had the door locked. He showed them the nail prints in his hands and feet. He then told them scriptures that said he would be raised from the dead. Jesus gathered his disciples together and told them to go into all the world and tell every person the things that they had seen and he gave them his name to use against the powers of darkness. And he gave them the powers that he had to heal the sick and bless the people. Then he began to raise through the clouds and went back into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God. Luke 2, 36-48. Mark 16, 15-19. The 
disciples went everywhere, preaching in the same way that Jesus did and in his name. They healed the sick and did many wonderful works. They carried on the works of Jesus. Today we can still use the name of Jesus because it belongs to us. The first disciples have since died and gone to heaven to be with the Lord. But we can carry on their works today. Jesus is with us as he was with them. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 7 and 8, Go, preach the kingdom of heaven, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Jesus told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. This means that someday Jesus will come to earth to catch his people away. We will go with him to the Father God's house in heaven, where there is joy forevermore. No more crying, no more sickness, no more death. If you have Jesus in your heart as your Savior, you will go to that place and be with Father God and Jesus. But if you don't, you can receive him into your heart as Lord and Savior by praying this simple prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I have sinned. I've done wrong things, and I'm very sorry that I've done them. I believe that Jesus Christ was punished for my sins, and I want you to forgive me. I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Thank you for saving me from sin and hell. I am now your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that you've done this, you're ready to go to heaven because you've become a child of God. All you have to do now is talk to him each day by praying and thanking him for all the things that he's done for you. Read your Bible, listen to God, and obey him. The end. If you're a teacher, these are some of the songs that I sing during our lessons once we've learned this lesson and the Bible memory verses about Jesus being rose from the dead and the power that we have over sickness and disease. I've mentioned all the verses so that you can use your Bible to find them and read the story yourself. Or you can play this video. I have this written on every pair of shoes I own. I own a lot of shoes. Ephesians 6, 12, Psalms 8, 6. Ephesians 18, 21 through 23, and 1 John 4, 4, and the name of Jesus. So everywhere I go, Satan sees the name of Jesus, and he knows that I am stomping him and taking the ground and having dominion over it as God said that we could. Every time I dance, every time I use flags, every time I march, Jesus gets all the glory as I worship him with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Satan has to back away. I hope you enjoyed our story, The Keys of the Kingdom by Willie George, and read by Reverend Julie Moore. God bless you.